Um, hello, everyone. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening uh, from wherever you are joining us. My name is Yehuda Mirsky. I am on the faculty of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies here at Brandeis. And uh, believe me when I say it's a very deep pleasure uh, to be able to introduce our presenter uh, today, Dr. Um, Michal Moshkat Barkan. Um, Michal is um, is an associate professor of Jewish education at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion and is the director of the Department of Education and Professional Development at the college's Jerusalem campus and founder of the Teachers Lounge program about um, on which her research is based uh, for her presentation today and about which we'll be hearing. Her fields of research include teachers mentoring, professional development, teacher ideologies, um, multiculturalism and pluralism in education. Um, if I may just for a moment, um, in addition to being deeply humble, uh, Dr. Mushkat Barkhan is a remarkable scholar practitioner, um, and her, her intellectual work and her practical teaching work profoundly inform one another. Um, in general, I think it's fair to say that her work over the years explore, explores the points of intersection between teachers' own subjectivities, teachers' own views and their ideological commitments, the subjects that teachers teach, and the institutional frameworks that both enable teachers and constrain them and through which um, they all have to work. And over the decades, she has steadily widened her frame of analysis uh, to the point now where she's going to share with us fruits of her work on a very large subject, uh, which is to say interactions of um, uh, Jewish, Israeli, and Palestinian teachers in Jerusalem. Um, in addition to her scholarly work and her educational work, I would be remiss if I did not mention that Dr. Moshkat Barkan has also been a key organizer of the really remarkable um, uh, pro-democracy or pro the, the protests and organization and civil society organization um, in response to the proposed uh, changes in Israel's judicial system that have uh, been going on for now, I think it's going to be 15 weeks straight of demonstrations. And she's been very much at the center of that on top of all her other work. And so it's a very deep, deep pleasure um, to hand the floor over to Dr. Uh, Michal Moshkat Barkhan. Um, we're happy to receive questions from you all. If you please could send them in the Q&A uh, feature of the Zoom. And if you'd like in the chat, um, please just to chime in and tell us uh, where you're joining us from. And uh, Dr. Mushkat Barkhan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yehuda. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Um, and uh, I'll be happy to speak with you. I, although I don't see you, but I guess you're there all over. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem as, uh, oh, good. Good to see where are you from. And uh, so hello to everybody. And uh, as you just said, in the um, last 16, 15 weeks, I'm involved in the protest for democracy in Israel. I think it is uh, part of what I do. Hi, Sharon. It is part of what I do uh, in my uh, everyday work when I work at HUC, trying to promote pluralism and uh, now multicultural, intercultural education. And um, thank you. It's great to see everybody, uh, everybody's names and places. I hope not to be confused by that. <laughs> and in a minute, I will start sharing with you my uh, my research. And uh, hi, Marcy. And okay, so I won't say hello to everyone uh, personally, but I'm happy that you are here. And thank you for writing. And uh, I wanna, um, as I said, I live in Jerusalem for 30 years and uh, in my, my research is about uh, teacher training including, and uh, pluralistic Jewish education. And for many years that I lead the educational department at HUC and uh, do collaborations with the Hebrew University in regards to pluralism within the Jewish, um, the Jewish, uh, um, the Jewish groups in Israel, uh, I, as a Jerusalem citizen, I realized that uh, we need to work also with the uh, Arab citizens and with the Arab population. And I will talk about uh, a program that was established in uh, 2014 
and uh, I'll share with you uh, both about this program that brings together for professional development Jewish and Arab teachers and also uh, the research that I conducted um, about uh, this program. I want to say thank you to you, Da, for uh, uh, encouraging and inviting me to share it with you. I want to say thank you to Sharon Feynman Nemzer, my mentor, and I'm really happy that you're here with us. And um, I'll start with a, a presentation and uh, I guess that questions I'll answer after I finish. As you see, uh, I'm gonna talk about the professional development program for Palestinian and Jewish teachers in uh, developing what I call local intercultural competence. Uh, the outline will be, I will talk a little bit about the context and then uh, I'll share the study question and the methodology that I use in this uh, study, the main findings, and I'll discuss uh, those findings and the educational implications. So I'll start by talking a little bit, just a little, I have a lot to say and there is a lot to learn about the Israeli context. Um, I'm, I will talk about uh, Jerusalem specifically, but uh, Jerusalem is a little bit uh, uh, may show uh, trends that Israel is, is going over. So uh, as you see at the left, you see the map of uh, Jerusalem by neighborhoods. Uh, the gray part is the Arab neighborhoods and the white parts are the, are the Jewish neighborhoods. Um, this is a city of neighborhoods. We live in neighborhoods and uh, we operate through our neighborhoods and uh, Jews and Arabs try not to go each to the other's neighborhood. So uh, I wanna say that although we try to avoid and not to get into, um, into danger because we are afraid of each other, but uh, life in Jerusalem uh, has many points of encounter. Uh, like you see the train uh, that we share, the street, uh, the... Um, the uh, the health system, which takes care of everyone. And I want to, I, I like this uh, photo, photograph of the Corona time where we felt that all human beings. And also as a, if at my Oz, uh, I, I try to find a way to, um, to articulate what's going on. And I like what if Atma Oz is saying that we live in an ongoing conflict, Israelis and Palestinians, yet we live in a coexistence uh, everyday life. And also since we are minority of Arabs and majority of Jews, there is a lack of equality because Jews have more access to, uh, to power, to the government, to the culture. So uh, if I need to say just in few words, some contextual uh, background, so I would say that. And also when we look at, uh, at the educational system, so uh, our kids study in separate system schools. Both, uh, most of uh, the, the tracks in Israel, we have them different for both. As uh, you see in the left side here, you have uh, the purple are Arabs in Israel, Arab students in Israel, also the, the perspective for the coming years. The, the green is the Haredi ultra-Orthodox uh, school system. The, the red is the Orthodox uh, Zionist school system. And the, and the blue is the state school, what is called secular, which is not secular. But all these four groups, uh, each of them had the school system for themselves. And um, and also within each group, there are separate school systems for the streams inside each, each group. So I'll go to the, um, to the right, um, right picture. You see here students in Jerusalem school system. And uh, you can see that the Arab population of students are more than a third the Haredi population is more than, much more than a third. And this small part 
which is in orange, is both general, uh, what I call secular, and Zionist Orthodox uh, students, which means that in this city, if you know, if we want to think about the future, the future of these students. We need to create opportunity, opportunities for them since they study in separate school system. We need to create opportunities for them to get in contact with each other, not to be afraid of each other, to, to find a way to get to know each other. Because, you know, I grew up in, in the Israeli state uh, Orthodox school system and I, I met uh, secular uh, people only in the army first time and I met Arab people only you know as, as colleagues only when I was 40. So it's not that not that I didn't see them but I didn't have friends and uh, this is something that if we think about education for the next generation there is a need to do something. So uh, Teachers Lounge was founded in 2014 as uh, in a pilot, I won't get into details. The program aim was to bring together Palestinian and Jewish educators in order to address the complex educational dimensions of Jewish and Palestinian encounters in the city of Jerusalem, which are uh, not often. I'll say a little bit about this uh, program, Teacher's Lounge, and now I think I'll move the bar up because I have something down here. Um, the structure is this. Uh, this program is built around ten meetings. Uh, uh, there are groups. Uh, every group has between fourteen to eighteen participants. Um, two facilitators. One is a Palestinian and one is a Jewish. And uh, in Jerusalem, most of the uh, Palestinians do not speak uh, Hebrew. So. If we want to get together, if we want uh, uh, teachers to get to know each other and speak, uh, we need to enable each of them to speak with their own language. There are many other reasons to do that, but it's not easy and I will get back to this. So people speak in their own uh, language. We have a translator in every group. And the contents, um, this is an, 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 the contents are, uh, the participants speak about, share stories about their homes. Uh, as you see the picture here of the map. So uh, people show where do they live in Jerusalem and, and the route that they go and they get to see what is the Jerusalem that they know and what is the Jerusalem that they avoid or don't know. They go to, uh, they design uh, tours in Jerusalem together. They go to homes, visit homes of each other, and they get to share places in Jerusalem that are due for them or they are afraid to go. So uh, it's a, what we call a experiential learning and uh, they have both experiences and time to reflect on them. Uh, since it, its inspection to 2022, there were 319 teachers who participated in this program. Uh, you can see almost half and half uh, Palestinian and, and Jewish teachers. Uh, the schools, the, there are many schools, uh, they come from many schools in Jerusalem since they decide if they want to come or not. They got accreditation for uh, participating in this program. So, um, and they come from 132 schools. Only one of them is an urban Jewish school together. The, uh, the study that I'm gonna share was uh, published at uh, Teachers College Record. And it's a part of uh, many other uh, data that I collected and, and some other uh, questions that I asked that are going to be published in uh, different uh, uh, articles, but now I'm going to share with you this um, this study. So the study aim was to examine the learning and experience of teachers particip uh, that participated in Teachers Lounge uh, professional development program. I wanted to to really ask them what did they learn, and I wanted to fill an analytic and theoretical gap that I witness sometimes in in the existing literature 
between stated aims of intercultural professional development program and the learning learned curriculum of such program. When I say learned curriculum, I I relate to what Kuban said uh, about the distinction between the, the intended curriculum, the taught curriculum, and the learned curriculum. So when I ask the participants what did they learn, I want to ask them what was the learned curriculum. The methodology of uh, this uh, study, uh, I collect, it was um, qualitative. I collect, I, I, with, I had two uh, assistant researchers, they are Palestinians, so we could speak with uh, each of the participants in their own language. They were fluent both in, in, in uh, Arabic and in Hebrew, and we conducted in-depth interviews uh, for Palestinian and Jewish teachers who volunteered to participate. Uh, we we uh, observed uh, many uh, group sessions and uh, we read participants' written commentaries and final writing projects. So it was kind of a triangulation uh, study which uses many uh, resources trying to integrate what we see and what we learn from all of them. Uh, we did, uh, I did a thematic analysis through codes at the beginning, open coding, and then I grouped them to categories. And then I, I uh, figured out uh, the main domains uh, of the, that uh, were, I, I saw them as the main areas of learning since that, that was my question. And, and through this, the grounded theory was developed. So few, I will share two, just two slides about the theoretical background uh, of, uh, of this uh, study. Uh, I want to say about intercultural competence. Since, you know, we can use many words for, for these uh, intergroup relations, uh, both um, uh, multicultural, intercultural. I use the term intercultural because it, it uh, talks about the positive interactions among the groups. And intercultural competence uh, is, I see this as, a, I use it as the ability commun to communicate effectively in intercultural situations, including acknowledging, valuing, and understanding cultural differences, experiencing other cultures, and having self-awareness of one's own culture. So these are competencies. And if I want to ask teacher, what did they learn? I want to see if they got any uh, com competency in, in the area of interculture, intercultural education. And when I look at intercultural professional development programs, so direct encounters have been suggested to have important role in teachers' professional development to create uh, intercultural competence. And, um, and reflective dispositions of teachers in relation to self and others and, and critical uh, views also are uh, uh, common goals of such professional development program. Now, uh, I wanna say something about, um, about encounters between groups and specifically about uh, between Palestinians and Jews, but uh, these approaches to encounters are uh, common approaches um, around the world. Maybe you, I'll, I'll stop share a little bit and talk to you, and then I'll come back to, to the slideshow, if that's okay. So uh, we have, uh, I wanna talk about three main um, approaches to encounters uh, between groups and especially the, those who are used in Israel and also some of them in Northern Ireland. So one, one uh, approach is what is called the, uh, the contact approach. The contact approach, which uh, our project 64 started, uh, says that uh, you have to bring together uh, the different groups in order to get them to know each other and to reduce stereotypes. And when you reduce stereotypes, because people get to know each other. So this is the main thing that we wanted to do because when we have groups that just uh, uh, are in a conflict, 
uh, and so this is the first first task. Um, the this uh, was this this approach is used um, widely in Northern Ireland, as I said. It's uh, really uh, people uh, researchers uh, show that it really reduces um, stereotypes. Yet uh, sometimes when you know people are together, but then something happened and the conflict, uh, they don't talk about the conflict when they get together. So this is the kind of disadvantage of the, the, this approach. They don't, they don't want, it's not that it's uh, for, forbidden, but they don't get to talk about it because this approach makes them emphasize the similarities amongst the group. So uh, also research has said that this is a be better approach. You know, it's easier for the majority than for the minority. And uh, the, a diff another approach for encounters is the narrative approach, which uh, asks the participants to share their own stories, their own memories, to talk about their families, to talk about their dispositions, to talk about where they came from and to share the way they live uh, their lives. And uh, this uh, approach uh, is subjective because it asks people not to talk about the situation, but to talk about themselves in the situation in terms of their personal lives. So this, uh, this approach enable people to try to understand what are others going through in situations of conflict. A third, um, third approach is the conflict approach, which tries to bring to the room, to the meetings, the conflict and ask people to talk about that. And sometimes it creates a conflict among the group. In Teacher's Lounge, we use both contact and narrative approach together, which uh, in a way that I'll show later. Another thing that I wanna say that uh, the use of language has, a, has an important role in these encounters. Uh, language can be a barrier in encounters when people, you know, sometimes people ask me, why won't you speak in English? So I say, English is not a good language for anyone. So I prefer them to speak both in Hebrew or in Arabic and both languages. And, uh, but sometimes when, when you speak only in one language, uh, like Hebrew in many places, not in Jerusalem, so it, it shows the power relations between uh, amongst the groups. So uh, now I will continue. The research question were, uh, what, Move it down. Okay. What did Palestinian and Jewish participants learn from their experience in an intercultural program? What was the learned curriculum? And how will Palestinian and Jewish uh, participants personally and professionally affected by the, in, their encounter with the other? And I will share with you uh, the findings. I'll do that. Uh, I'll start with a presentation of the framework that I created after analyzing uh, the findings, and then I'll go back to that uh, to that model. Uh, so, uh, look. So, uh, when I ask what did the participant learn from uh, being in this uh, program? Uh, I found basically four areas of learning, which I want to show to you now. Uh, the contextual knowledge, the professional identity and community, pedagogical implication and self-awareness, which all of them create uh, what I call teachers' local intercultural competence. Each of these areas has several, uh, I divided it into two uh, sub-areas. And I wanna just give you a taste of uh, how I learned uh, this and what, what people shared with me so I could generalize uh, these outcomes. So I will go uh, area by area. So the contextual knowledge, and I will ask uh, Yuda and Shayna to help me uh, so I won't speak all the time. Um, Yuda, if you're uh, ready to read Amani, what Amani said, and I will just say before 
that the group decided to visit uh, two homes, one of, uh, one of the groups. Uh, I'm going to share with you from many groups. So one of the groups, the Amani's group, which is uh, an Arab teacher, a Palestinian teacher, they decided to visit uh, home of Benny. Benny is an ultra-Orthodox uh, principal. He was part of the group. And they went to visit uh, their home. He and his wife shared with the group um, how they live and how where they send their kids to study and what are uh, what what is it to live in an uh, ultra orthodox neighborhood and this is what Amani said to me in the interview. So Yuda, please yes. read it. I really liked the visit to Benny's home. I learned a lot about their life, the synagogue, the customs, and so on. I'd always seen the external differences. And only when I was at their home did I understand what's behind the scenes. Thank you. Me, uh, uh, Amani wasn't the only person who said that because many of the Jewish participants, that was first time for them also to visit in an ultra-Orthodox home. So for many of them, what I call the, the cultural learning uh, was also new for them. They never visited an, an, in an ultra-Orthodox home. Uh, the next uh, citation will be a citation of, uh, of um, in one of the meetings of one of the groups. The group was uh, discussing uh, one of the, the Arab teachers, the Palestinian teacher, shared how her students uh, who live, some of her students who live in Shuafat, which is a neighborhood in the north of Jerusalem, part of it is behind the fence, the, the security or the, the separation fence, depends how you call it. So her students have to cross the fence every morning when they get to the school. And the teachers were talking, how is it for them to cross every day a fence before getting into the school? So after this, uh, they, they shared this story, Einat, a Jewish teacher said what I'm, I want Shana please to read. These children crossing the checkpoint are coming from their homes. The soldiers standing at the checkpoint are also coming from our homes. They, i.e. the soldiers, could have been my students or my kids. Do we have a way of influencing what happens to them when they meet at the checkpoint? Thank you. So this is what I call a contextual knowledge learning because now they get to see uh, the life, the, the way that others experience the situation in Jerusalem, the, the way that even if it's cultural or political, geopolitical, so they get to see how it influences their life. And they think about it also as, as adults, as parents, and as teachers. Now I, I want to go to um, another uh, domain of learning, and I will talk about self-awareness. When they uh, get to, to ask questions and participate in this uh, professional development, many of the participants in the research shared what they learn about themselves, what they saw about their own stereotypes, their own uh, pre-assumptions. So um, we won't read all of them, but I'll ask Yehuda to read Mati's uh, comment. Everything that was said in the room was translated from Arabic to Hebrew or from Hebrew to Arabic, a clumsy practice that dictates a slow pace of progress. At the beginning, it felt like a burden and I reacted with impatience and internal anger. I noticed that my anger resulted from my impatience, but also I must admit from the fact that I wasn't comfortable relating to Hebrew and Arabic as equal. So this is something that Mati got to realize about himself and he wrote a beautiful, um, essay saying how, what happened to him in relation to those two languages and where he started, what was Arabic for him as a soldier, then what was Arabic for him in the group, how he felt about that. He really was impatient at the beginning. And then he realized what, what was happening to him, to him in relation to power relation between the groups and in, in relation to himself. And, um, I want to say something before we read what Rada said. Rada is a, a Palestinian teacher, and many of the Palestinian teachers said to us that um, that professional development programs that they are used to in East Jerusalem, many of them, they go and hear lectures about content that they have to teach, about ways to teach uh, students. And this was uh, first time for them 
of an experience, experiential learning where uh, they had to talk because they didn't hear any lecture coming to teach them anything. So at the beginning, they asked themselves, what are we learning here? So this is what Radha said, and uh, Shaina, if you're willing to read. Yeah. Be happy. Each of the participants has a part. We are the ones who talk and share stories and experiences, and we don't just sit and listen to a lecture. I understand that this program is about me, and if I don't come, my voice will be missing. Thank you. So I want to say something about the, the fact that most of the teachers are women, women. And uh, for Palestinian women, women to, to have a voice to talk about what they feel is something new. And not only for Palestinian women, but for teachers. The fact that teachers are asked to say, what do they think, what's their stories? I think that sometimes teachers are, don't, are not asked about those uh, things. Maybe their principals are asked to say, what do they think? But teachers, um, not that much. So for many of the teachers, especially the Palestinians, uh, the women, uh, it was really important and not easy. And for Palestinians, sometimes to share what do they think with Jewish people, they were suspicious at the beginning. And many of them, they take the time to decide what they want to share and what they don't want to share. Okay. So the pedagogical implications. Many of the teachers, when we ask them how this... Uh, this professional development program affected what you do in your classes. So we got different uh, stories and reactions. Uh, I will share only three of them because of the time. And if you want me, I'll share more. Um, after the, you know, as I told you at the beginning, they have to, the teachers have to show in the map, map of Jerusalem, where do they live? And, and what are the routes that they use when they go from home to school? and, and uh, more and then they get to see that each of them is concentrated in one part of the city and not they don't know all the places in the city. So Amy, a high school um, Jewish teacher, she said what I will ask uh, Yehuda to read please. When we did the activity with the maps, I was blown away by how unfamiliar we are with the eastern part of Jerusalem. So we're doing the same activity with maps for our students in preparation for going on the light rail and showing them that most of their lives take part in the western part of the city and that they rarely go to the eastern part. Thank you. So she created with her colleagues in the school um, a kind of an experiential learning using the, the light rail in Jerusalem, which uh, goes through uh, east and west Jerusalem. And so she created a map for them, asking them to look around and find new areas that they've never been uh, there. And um, the other story, the Hansa story, I want to share, it's not an easy one. She told us that uh, she came to her third grade classroom in East Jerusalem, and uh, it was a day after a bomb attack in one of the markets in, in Tel Aviv. And, and the third graders, uh, girls were uh, we're happy. So here's what she said. Please, Shaina, can you read it? News died yesterday. They called in excitement. I said to them, you know that the terrorist killed whoever was sitting at the cafe in the market. It could have also been me. They kill people, and we should not celebrate the killing of innocent people. So Hansa said that she felt, after uh, participating in this program, that she's responsible to react or this kind of, uh, of um, you know, of, of words and, and uh, actions from her students, which she felt before that she did not have, um, she didn't know what to say to them. And now she felt that she could say something about that. Uh, in the picture, you see uh, one of the participants sent to us uh, an activity that she did with her Arab uh, students she asked them to bring pictures of Jerusalem from different eyes. So uh, they had to look at Jerusalem to see, to Google it, but to see that Jerusalem is holy for different uh, religions and people. So she said this was an activity that 
she did with them after participating in the program. The fourth domain, uh, which I will share with you, is something that happened amongst the teachers. Uh, they felt uh, a professional identity and a kind of an inter um, intercultural kind of intercultural community because they got much more involved uh, with their colleagues, both in the group but also in their own schools, in regard to questions of um, Jews and Arabs and the relationships uh, amongst them. So I'll ask Yehuda to read what Dana said, please. As a result of the activity, I helped one of my colleagues to deal differently in a more direct and personal way with an Arab worker at the school. Thank you. And, uh, and Fasta uh, said after coming, uh, after she, she said that um, she talked about her teacher's uh, room at her school and she told us what happened year after year. So Shana, if you are willing to read that. The discourse in our school has changed. I'm participating in the program right now, and another teacher from the school participated last year, and it really creates a discussion among the teachers. Getting to know the people personally is the way to solve everything, not just political issues, also things that happen in class. Everything is solved through dialogue, through knowing people. Thank you very much. So um, I would say that, uh, I'll go back now to the this uh, model, but uh, if if we look at uh, around, we can see the reality. So we see uh, that there's sociocultural and political environment that uh, where the the this professional development program is taking place. It is related to both the coexistent part of life. The, con the ongoing and unresolved conflict and the lack of equality between the, these two populations. Everything of those parts uh, came to life in, in the encounters and the teachers related to those parts. And if we look at uh, so the, the intercultural professional development program, which I, I, uh, I describe it as a, a dotted circle, uh, brings to the groups the the political and, and sociocultural environment and when where i think that they develop uh intercultural competence this competence i notice that it's local it is related to the unique um uh, unique characters of the place where it takes place and uh when when they learn the contextual knowledge so they learn about the political reality of the other in their city in Jerusalem and they learn about cultural uniqueness differences and similarities of the people of the specific people where that they met they they uh learned about themselves they learned about um being be, about an option to become professional community and also we saw that they develop ways to uh, work differently with uh, their students and uh, the way that they teach. So it could be um, a kind of a happy end to see these these uh, results because I think you know when we started this program we didn't know what actually the teachers learn, and now we can generalize the areas of learning. It's not that all the teachers learned everything and not all the areas, but if, if I want to see what are the domains of learning, we have a picture. But then what happens, uh, and this happens in Israel, uh, unfortunately, almost every year. Um, it's May 2021, uh, started a round of violence between uh, Jewish and Palestinian people all over the country. And I was, won't get into the details and the story and what happens because now I'm talking only about this program. But I said that this, uh, this um, event really got all of us um, so sad. And we, we thought that everything that was built and learned is ruined. And uh, we can continue talking to each other, learning from each other, because what will happen, it was really stressful and uh, 
at the beginning, people in the program did not want to get together. Arab didn't want to meet Jews. Jews were uh, very sad and um, and they didn't have any faith that they can uh, want meet the Arabs. And it took time to get back to encounters. I can talk about that a lot, but when I look at uh, and and. At the end, people came back together, and then in 2022, we opened more than more than uh, one more than four groups of Jerusalem, which I will get back to this. But when think when I'm thinking about possible implications, I always take in, in account that violent events are happening, coming and going, and uh, and it is important to know that this is a part the a part of what we have to go through. And, uh, and I want to say that the main domains of learning were similar for both Palestinian and Jewish participants. Sometimes they learn different things, but these were the main domains of learning. Um, when combining the contact and the narrative approaches, it helped teachers to develop intercultural capacities to suit the local and social geopolitical context, because you know, we, from time to time, when they needed, they got to the contact uh, activities, being together, uh, walking together, laughing, uh, eating, and and then they could go back to share narratives, share their their um, their pains, their uh, things that they don't believe to each other. So it helps to continue this. Um, this ongoing dialogue, even in stressful times, because people get to know that sometimes what they hear in the um, uh, in the news is uh, only a way of someone to phrase what's going on, and sometimes it's fake news. And intercultural professional development program can cultivate awareness to power relations alongside with humanizing the other and building professional and personal bridges. So uh, really it helped to, uh, to, to understand that when sometimes uh, people are more into understanding the power relations and the, and the pain that, uh, that our, uh, both groups create to each other, it, it's only one part of being together and living together. And a teacher local intercultural competence, major learning uh, uh, competencies is to link teaching with the wider social and political local challenges. So it helps us to see that professional development program not only can, but sometimes need to, to, to create that link. And it offers educators and researchers to critically examine the interactions between professional development and social and political realities. So I would say that uh, since the, this program started in Jerusalem, I believe that uh, it can teach also, it can be, a, a, it can offer a way to work with other teachers in other uh, conflicted cities. Um, after uh, after uh, eight years in only in Jerusalem, uh, we opened one group in West Galil and uh, and one and a group in Ramle and a group in Tel Aviv uh, Jaffa, and uh, understanding that each group needs to have local sensitivity and understanding its uh, local culture. It helped uh, designing each of the groups. So I will uh, conclude here and um, I'll be happy to take some questions. And thank you, Shana, thank you. Yuda, for reading. Thank you. Um, so thank you. Thank you for really, for such a, a rich presentation, which we could talk about for a very long time. So um, we've gotten a few sorts of questions and uh, I would like to start with a couple that, talked about this the the um the kind of institution that you mentioned only in passing but people are interested in which is these joint Jewish Arab schools right okay was the one one very specific question was the Jewish Arab school um a a school run by the hand in hand organization yes. right? tell people a little yes. bit about yes it was 
And yeah. are there other organizations in that in that space uh, that you know of or that you want to share? And then I, we no, the only organization that runs a school uh, in Jerusalem uh, that is integrated is hand in hand. I do know that there are several uh, Arab Palestinian students who their parents and them decide to go in high school to Jewish school. So right. not, so in um, yeah, and, and also just can't not mention uh, one of my daughters recently introduced me to a, a, a TV series uh, called Madrasa, which is this yeah. uh, sort of a comedy about yes. uh, Jewish Arab school. Um, yeah. One one member of our of our one person here with us in the seminar said that their observation um, of some of the the hand in hand Jewish Arab schools uh, was that there was sort of a disconnect between the intercultural competence, interest, et cetera, of the teachers and the students. And that even when the teacher, and that if I, if I understood the, the, the question correctly, you know, that the teachers um, have, um, uh, the, 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 you know, sort of the teachers have this intercultural competence, doesn't transfer easily to the students. And certainly once they leave the door of the school and, and that that's a, um, you know, what, what do you, uh, what do you think about that? You know, I think this is the, the mystery of, uh, of the gap between the taught curriculum and the learned curriculum, mm -hmm. which uh, I think as teachers, we always face, not always we are uh, aware of. So this was the reason that I conducted this study. I wanted to hear the teachers who participated in the program, what did they learn? And I, I want to encourage them also to try and understand from their own students, what uh, did they learn? I, I can share a story of my kid. He was in fourth grade in a, in, in a Jewish school uh, and the teachers uh, told us proudly that uh, at, uh, one day they're gonna meet with Arab kids from an Arab school. And they were so happy and proud to say that they will have this program. And after it happened, they shared with us, we did that, we did that, we had dialogues, we many things. And when my kid went back home, it was in fourth grade, I asked him, how was it? And he said, I went to drink water and our, and our boy just hit me. So that was for him the, the learned uh, curriculum. So, you know, we never know what our students learn, actually learn, but I encourage all of us to try and ask them. And sometimes, you know, they will remember that they did something together. I, 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 uh, I work with many teachers from hand in hand, and I think they're doing amazing work with the teachers in terms of their own professional development, which mm -hmm. is really important. And I also get to know some of the graduates of hand in hand, and also I learn from them things that they think that they didn't learn. I see how much they learned in terms of values and practices. Mm -hmm. Um, so another question that came in, uh, what's your sense of the participants, how the participants are viewed by their families and neighbors? Do their families, okay. neighbors, other colleagues support them, discourage them? If you wouldn't mind talking about that. Okay, so uh, we asked them, one of the questions that we asked them in the in evaluation form, so to whom, you know, with whom did you share what happened to you in this program? And they say, many of them say that they shared it with their family. One of the teachers, you know, many say also that they share it with the, their students. And one of the teachers said to us, you know, after every meeting, I go back to my seven classes of eighth grade and I tell each of them, you don't, you won't believe what I did yesterday. I want to show, I want to tell you with whom I met. So these are part of the group. And, you know, I had a, an Arab teacher that teaches at the refugee camp in, in Shoafat. She took pictures of all the group activities and she posted it in her Facebook and teacher uh, asked her, aren't you afraid of posting this, this picture? She said, I'm not afraid. I wanna show everybody what I'm doing. So these are part of the stories, but I have also teachers who really are afraid and don't want us to take pictures of them and don't share with their families because um, their families won't uh, support what they're doing. And so I have many examples also of um, teachers who, who are afraid to share. And and do you find, um, is is there a, are more, the teachers who have to deal with negative reactions are more afraid to share 
are more of them Jewish or more of them Palestinian or it or it's kind of evenly divided? I never uh, did, uh, I, I never, you know, I, I'm not sure. I just don't right. want to say because mm -hmm. every time I meet someone and I'm surprised. I want to say that my stereotypes uh, were challenged here because some of the teachers that I would say they're very firm, they may be afraid to share. So they telling me that they share with everyone and some others that I don't think mm -hmm. they will have a problem to share what they're doing. And they say that they are afraid a little bit to share. So I just don't want to. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned briefly the the violence of May 2021 and that that sort of thundered into the proceedings and then you said that the group was able to sort of come back together afterwards could you please talk a little bit about about how that happened and what was the role the fact that people had prior relationships with one another up to this, right? That this took place well into your academic year. What sort of difference that might have made? So I will say that that year was really a tough year because uh, the the violent round happened just before the last meeting of the group, the, the last not meeting, but the last celebration event <laughs> that we planned. So and it was during the Ramadan. The Ramadan is a month where we don't meet. So they didn't meet for a month, almost a month. And then the violence started. And then most of them didn't want to meet at all. And I learned, and I was afraid that all this program is going to be ruined because they didn't want to meet. And then um, the, the process was that the Jews, many of the Jews said, okay, now is the time to meet. Now, if you're serious, Arab colleagues, please come and meet with us. The Arab says, we can't meet with you now. And the Jewish people uh, interpreted in, in bad ways as if they, okay, we don't have any faith on you. Okay, you don't want to meet with us. And then we, we gathered all the facilitators, which was a really tough, um, tough discussion because each of the facilitators shared their own fears, their own anger about the other. People cried. It was a, a tough meeting. And we decided together to create separate uh, encounters, only Arabs, only Jews. And many of the participants uh, were really angry. And it was in the Corona time. So we said it will be via Zoom. So it was hard. And then uh, after what, that, what, what, just if I could just press you for a second, what were they angry about? They were angry about sometimes about, you know, if we're serious, we have to get together. Why are you doing it separately? And we said, we will do one separate and one together, but we need to prepare ourselves. So, uh, so people get uh, to Zoom and um, it was, you know, when in the Corona time, everything was harder. It was via Zoom and then we said, okay, let's meet. So the end of the year when people, and that was a meeting that it was part of, it wasn't a part of the 10 meetings because we finished the 10 meetings. So whoever wanted to come to the 11th meeting after the round of violence, they were the brave people who decided they want to come. So each of the four groups created an encounter, not all the participants arrived. But a year later, we got a second year people who wanted to continue. And we got people who wanted to enroll. It was the, you know, last year was the, the, the biggest year. Many people wanted to enroll after after the violent round. So I, I realized that things don't happen immediately. They have to take the time. It won't happen right after a violent event. We need to wait. We need to work slowly. This is a process thing. And we need to believe that we're doing the right thing. My Palestinian colleague and I always talk about that, that, mm -hmm. you know, we're doing our best and then comes the reality and ruin everything that we wanted to do. And we all pray that it won't happen before the encounter, after the encounter, how it affects the, the program, you mm -hmm. know, it's bigger than us. So um, another question, and, and ordinarily we don't name who the questions are from, but I can't not mention this comes from our, our really, you know, honored and beloved 
colleague uh, Sharon Feynman Nims. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, she asks the, your program and your work. Uh, we've been talking about effects in communities, teachers, classrooms, the local authorities. How do the local educational authorities notice this? Uh, the Israeli Ministry of Education. What notice does it take of this kind of work? What sort of in, what sort of what sort of reverberations, if any, positive, negative, or who knows, um, in these in these larger administrative systems that are so crucial for for a centralized educational system like like Israel's? What how do they how does how does this bounce off of them? So I want to say that so far, until the last election, which I'm not yet, I don't yet know how it will affect. Uh, the uh, Jerusalem municipality was really in favor of this program. They supported it from the beginning, not with money, but uh, they really supported teachers who wanted to come. And the Ministry of Education, the, the state system, really supported it from the beginning by giving the, all the participants uh, the accreditation for. Right. Okay, I mean, just 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 to explain, you mean accredit that for their this you know this counts as part of their ongoing teacher training and and that's factored yes. into the bureaucracy in all kinds of ways. Yes. Yes. So so when people uh, uh, want to enroll to this program, they get accreditation. So we got really a supportive environment from both the Ministry of Education and from the Jerusalem Municipality Education Department, yet it's not funded by them. So we have to find the funding to create this such an expensive program because if we need two facilitators and a translator and we need to train the, the staff, it is really expensive so we need to find the money for that is, is there a reason i mean it, I, not whether we shouldn't we don't have to get into the weeds of this but what is the reason that this program though though the municipality and the education ministry are so in favor of it they they're not putting money on it this is a good question Yes. No, I, I mean, I, and we're not going to get into all of this, but yeah, I, mean, I would it, say it, no. I, I would put it like this because a question in Israel generally, all sorts of programs towards multiculturalism, pluralism, and so on and so forth over the years have been funded by other entities, especially from abroad, right? Yes. Like the Abichai Foundation or whomever. Is it that their working assumption is well, some well-meaning philanthropist from North America will take care of this? Or is it some? Or this isn't. This is something they really like, but they're not about to take budget that they need for core subjects, et cetera, and put it on this. I would say that uh, since this program started from outside of the system, it's kind of a grassroots program. You know, a, a different body, a different institution. We are not part of the educational administration in Israel, mm -hmm. so we. In, innovated this program. So they say, if you want, just go and do it. We won't interfere, but you have to find a way to, uh, to fund it. I would say even that, uh, you know, I can talk a lot about funding groups that are outside of the system. When I am a part of this, I think, why won't they fund it? But I think it's, it's uh, it's not an easy thing to decide who you want to fund uh, if you if you see many innovations, mm -hmm. because uh, there are many innovative groups that want to do things. We have to show that we success in this. I mm -hmm. want to say that the mayor of Jerusalem uh, promised us uh, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, help in in the budgeting. So he is in favor of this, but um, you know priorities. And I don't know. I think that now within this government that we have now, I'm not sure that they will find this funding. This doesn't for, sound uh, like something very in keeping with their policy priorities. Yes. So, um, so right. We so, are kind of under the radar now. So. so among the among the the the, the intercultural divides that we're talking about here are also have to do with religion and secularity. Yes. Both among so so some we've gotten some questions like on a very practical level, right? Okay. Um, you know, sort of the 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 Muslim the Muslim and the the Jewish teachers who keep kosher. Do they eat in each other's homes, and how do you navigate okay. that? And then more broadly, to what extent do do um, questions of you know religion 
and because also in Israel, of course, secularism is is a kind of ideology in ways that it isn't in America, and not and not just among Jews. So how did how did those issues come up, and okay. how did you navigate them? So I want to show you uh, we I want to show you uh, two short movies uh, that uh, one of them answers directly to your question, and the other one, you know, there are two mm -hmm. strong movies that we created. Uh, we um, you know, after doing this research, I decided that I want to hear that not only to to analyze what teachers said, but also to enable teachers to write their own stories. So we created a, a work, a writing workshop, and teachers wrote their experience in Teachers Lounge, and uh, we took two of them and made a short video out of them. So I will show you, and I I want to ask all of you to look at both of them and ask yourself. What were the teachers learning from this program? What kind of learning was it in what areas and domains? So I'll, I'll share with you. أخبرت أمي أنه اختار منزلي للزيارة. لم ترحب أمي بالفكرة. كان جل ما يشغلها ماذا سفكر الناس بنا وماذا سيقولون عنا. ماذا سفعل سيفعل الغرباء في بيتنا ولماذا نحن؟ أجبتها بأنهم سيحضرون في المساء وبذلك لن يرهم أحد ووعدتها بأنهم سيكونون ضيوفا لطفاء هم فقط سيتعرفون على بيتنا وأهله ونحن سنكون زيارتهم الأولى لبيت عربي فعلينا أن نكرمهم انتهى الحوار بأن هذه الزيارة ستكون ضمن مسؤوليتي بكل ما يترتب عليها من تحضيرات أو نتائج وفي صباح الزيارة سألتني أمي ماذا يأكل أصدقائك؟ هل مسموح لهم بالأكل أو الشراب بأطباقنا وكاساتنا؟ أم علينا أحضار أدوات بلاستيكية؟ أجبتها كوني على طبيعتك وهم سيختارون ماذا سيفعلون استقبلتهم أمي في ابتسامة خجولة هي لا تحبهم هي فقط تعرفهم من أحداث الأخبار خائفة لكنها مضيافة قدمت الطعام والشراب لعلهم يمدحون أكلها وبعد عدة لحظات وتساؤلات منهم سمعت ضحكات أمي وانسجامها معهم لم أفكر في نكبة أو نكسة لم أفكر في قسوتهم في كل مرة نعبر فيها حاجزا عسكريا فكرت فقط كإنسان يرغب في اكتشاف عالمي That was first. I hope it answered to your question. Also, it's very interesting how she handles that. She says, "We'll do what we'll do, and they will choose." Yes. So, in many groups, this this is what happens, and sometimes facilitators ask uh, the the participants if they need kosher food, so they will buy it before, or people bring uh, something to eat, so they will mark it if it's kosher mm -hmm. or not. Um, Many, many things happen around food. So mm -hmm. it, I, I have many stories to share about that. Yes. So this is a kind of what, what I call a cultural learning and also an, an introspection of, of, uh, of the teachers about the teacher, about what are we doing? Are, do I want my neighbors to see us? Do they look Jewish? You know, how are we seen by others? So this is uh, one, one story. The other one, which I want to share, um, is, uh, is it, it, it talks about the contextual knowledge. And it's not an easy one, but I'll show it to you. Sikha <laughs> b'achad ha-mifgashim. Yoshvim b'zugot u-misuchachim. Hi arviya, ani yehudiya. היא עם חיג'אב אדום, אני עם מטפחת אדומה. מרחוק זה נראה אותו דבר. היא יותר צעירה, אימא לילדים קטנים. אני יותר מבוגרת, הנכדים שלי בגיל של הילדים שלה. אנחנו מספרות קצת על המשפחות. אני מספרת לה על הבן הקטן שלי, התינוק שלי. הוא חייל, כרגע באימון מתקדם, ובעוד כמה שבועות יגיע לשמירה בשטחים, אולי בחברון, אולי בגוש עציון, אולי בשומרון. היא שואלת, את לא מפחדת? אני מפחדת מאוד, אני עונה לה, לא ישנה בלילות מרוב דאגה. היא לא מבינה, אז למה הוא הלך לצבא? למה הסכמת שהוא ילך? אני במקום אחר לגמרי. 
זו גאווה בשבילנו שהוא הלך לצבא, להיות קרבי. הוא שומר עלינו, הוא נותן לנו תחושת ביטחון. זו זכות, ולא רק חובה. היא אומרת, בשבילך הוא חייל, בשבילי הוא טרוריסט. קשה לי מאוד לשמוע את זה. ההשוואה נוראית בעיניי, אבל אני לא מתווכחת. מנסה לראות את זה בעיניים שלה, מנסה להבין מה זה חייל בשבילה. חייל, אותו אחד שעוצר אותה ואת משפחתה במחסום, בודק אותם, חודר לפרטיות שלהם. חייל, אותו אחד שמפזר הפגנות, לעיתים יורה כדורי גומי או זורק רימוני עשן, ולפעמים גם פוגע. חייל, אותו אחד שמבצע מעצרים של חשודים, נכנס לבתים של אנשים שישנים בנחת ובשלווה ומערער את עולמם. חייל זה כוח, זה נשק, זה פחד, זה חוסר אונים. בדיוק ההפך מהראייה שלי. איך מגשרים על הפער הזה? speaks for itself. Yes. I want to say that when we showed this picture, this movie to the group, uh, one of the, our participants raised her hand. So I will start with Rivki, the one who, the teacher who wrote this. She shared it with her son uh, when he was a soldier and, uh, and he showed it to his, uh, to his um, group of soldiers. They saw it together and they spoke about it. And then she showed it to her students at 12th grade. She teaches girls and she spoke about it with them. And then when we show it to, we showed it to the group of her teachers who wrote, you know, we, we gathered together all the teachers who wrote uh, the, the stories and we showed this. One of the Arab teachers raised her hand and she said, I want to thank you, Rizki, because This is the first time that I know that you see me. And this is the first time that I know what you feel in regards to your son. And that is a soldier, that there is a different way to look at soldiers than I look at them. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and did issues of, I mean, it's interesting in, in this last film, both the teachers are religious, right? And uh, you know, in, in, but, uh, no, but, uh, but no, but the question is, how did those issues come up or not come up, not just with this group, not with, just with these two, but in general, how did that religion and secularity play themselves out in the group or wasn't that important? No, it always plays a role because Jerusalem is a very religious city. So most of the participants, both, Jews and Arabs, Palestinians, they are religious. So they, you know, they, they stop to pray. And mm -hmm. uh, there are many, they, they love to speak about the religion. Okay, so, so it's one of the only places in Jerusalem where the differences <laughs> in religion don't lead to blows. Um, yeah. We only have a couple of minutes left. Is there anything you might want to add? And I know that you've also been... I mean, because some of the questions in the chat were about, well, to what extent does this relate to American situations or not? Mm -hmm. And we didn't bring you here as a, as a situation, as an expert on American society. But this focus on place and trying to understand and, and bringing people together through the place that they share and the different ways in which they interpret the place and the space that they share. Um, it, would you like to offer some closing yeah. thoughts on that before we wrap up? Thank you, Yuda. Uh, another, uh, now I'm analyzing in a different article that uh, I'm working on, what I call, I, I found, find out that when uh, our participants are discussing their relations to places, to particular places, to concrete places, they get to see much more about their own world. And I call this hermeneutics of place. I, I think that in discussing places, shared places, different places, um, I, when they discuss their own relations to places, when they take each other to places that they've never seen before or that they always passed and never saw 
the way that the other one is, uh, is experiencing the same place, I found it as a pedagogic, um, powerful practice. So I think that in thinking of different uh, cultures, different areas, in thinking of places that are not Jerusalem and that are not Israel, this may be a human being an mm -hmm. educational powerful tool because we live in a time where, you know, we see many, many uh, societies that are so polarized, so divided and conflicted. And we need to find ways to educate ourselves, our teachers, our students to get to interact uh, in a human way and to learn the other's perspective on the same areas that we live and to build together a future that we can, you know, live together. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a powerful tool, not only for Jerusalem and Israel. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Michal Mushkat Barkan for a wonderful presentation about the remarkable work that you and your, your colleagues are doing. Um, and thank you to, to my colleagues here um, in, at the Schusterman Center, to Meng Chi Tian, who sort of kept all of this going today, Risa Singer, and to Dr. Shana Weiss for, for shepherding us all and moving us forward here. Um, and I just want to mention we have a few other events coming up uh, starting this um, Saturday, uh, Sunday evening, um, and then the following and Monday. Uh, we're having our annual conference, and it's on Ethiopian Israelis and the creation of knowledge, encounters of homeland and diaspora, starting with a concert by Giliallo on, on Sunday evening, and then workshops through the day. Um, our Sephardi Modernity Seminar Series, done by my wonderful colleague and neighbor here, Professor Yuval Ipri, um, will be holding a seminar on May 9th, uh, Sephardi Musical Modernities, Listening to the Past in the Future. Um, and we'll, we'll be hearing there from um, Edward Sarusi and Yara Dalal, wonderful scholars. And finally, our last Schusterman seminar of the uh, year will be coming before that on April 27th, uh, Making the Desert Bloom, Otto Warburg and Botanical Zionism, uh, circa 1900 to 1930. And the presenter will be Dana von Suffren. Um, so thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Mushkat Barkhan and everyone at Schusterman. And everyone um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.